topics in scripture that the Bible teaches a lot on and in much detail. We do not have to wonder what the Bible teaches about salvation. Clear pictures are given in verses like Acts 2 verse 38, Mark 16 verse 16, Acts 22 verse, six, uh, verse 16, Galatians chapter 3 26 to 29, Ephesians 2 1 and 1 to 10, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Romans 6, 1 to 4, and Colossians 2, 11 to 15, and there are more verses than that. These are the ones I just chose to list. However, there are also topics that the Bible introduces us to, but doesn't give us a lot of detail on. For this reason, mankind has done a massive amount of speculation on these topics in order to satisfy our curiosity or perhaps build up some doctrines that we believe the Bible teaches. One of these topics has to do with angels and demons. And by the way, if you're wondering why I picked this topic, this topic was suggested uh, by one of the members here at the end of every year. Uh, I, I have a box at the back and I encourage uh, members to uh, give topics that they would like to hear on that they hadn't heard on a while or might have questions about. And I try to spread out those questions throughout the year based on what I believe is the most important things that people want to understand. And then as the year progresses, we get into maybe some of the more novel topics. But angels and demons were requested. In preparing for this lesson, I searched my dad's computer archives to see the sermons that he preached on the topic. I have about 13 years of his sermons on my computer. And in total, I found one sermon that he preached on angels and two that he preached on demons during this time period. Now that doesn't mean that he didn't refer to angels and demons in other sermons or that he didn't repeat a sermon every now and then, but it does show us that because the Bible does give us limited knowledge on the topic of angels and demons, and because like me, my dad doesn't like to speculate in his sermons or didn't like to speculate in his sermons, that he didn't focus too much on this topic. However, since scriptures do mention angels and demons, it is good for us to know what we can know about them. As I just said, though, we're only going to be focusing on what the Bible does tell us. We're not going to be going off into the realm of speculation or extra-biblical sources, for they're not inspired of God and therefore are not really that useful in helping develop our biblical understanding. So what can we know about angels and demons? Let's first start off by discussing angels. The first thing we need to know is what the word angel itself means. In the Old Testament, the word angel is translated from the Hebrew word malak, M-A-L-A-K, which means messenger. While in the New Testament, angel is translated from the Greek word agello, A-G-G-E-L-L-O, which carries the same meaning, messenger. So what this definition is telling us is when we see the word angel used, that doesn't automatically mean that we're speaking of the heavenly beings that we so often associate this word with, for the word itself is actually describing the function, not the being. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Jesus is speaking to the seven churches of Asia. When beginning a new section that is addressed to a specific church, he addresses it to the angel of the church. Some take this to mean as some sort of a guardian angel or of a heavenly being for each church, but that isn't demanded by the context. The passage could literally be read to the messenger of the church. Just like apostles means, the word apostle means sent out and could refer to the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ or simply one who is sent out, angel means messenger and could refer to the heavenly being or simply a messenger. In the Old Testament, the word angel is even sometimes used 
to describe God himself. In fact, the very first instance where we find the word angel in the book of Genesis, the word is referring to God and not some other heavenly being. Turn to Genesis chapter 16. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 14. Genesis 16, verses 7 through 14. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, Sarai's maiden, uh, maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. He, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Royai. By just reading verse 7, we might assume that God sent an angel to Hagar to tell her these things. But the rest of the passage doesn't allow for this interpretation. Verse 10 said, Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. The verse doesn't say that the angel of the Lord said that God would multiply Hagar's descendants, but that I would do so. Do heavenly beings other than God have the power that this angel ascribes to himself? Not that I read in scripture. Moreover, Haggai understood who was speaking to her, for in verse 13 we read, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. She knew it was God who spoke to her and not some other being. And if you read the account of Abraham raising the knife to strike Isaac in Genesis 22, angel is used to describe God. When Jacob had a dream in Genesis 31, angel is used to describe God. And when Moses sees the burning bush in Exodus 3, angel is used to describe God. You could say in all of those passages that God is his own messenger. So knowing this, we must be careful when we see the word angel that we understand the context so that we don't jump to the wrong conclusion. But since most people think of the heavenly beings when thinking of angels, that's what we'll focus on from this point forward. So what we must understand is then, for focusing on these heavenly beings, what is an angel? In Hebrews chapter 1, Verse 7 we read, And of the angels he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? Some think angels are lesser gods, or perhaps men and women who have died. But this passage doesn't tell us this. It tells us that angels are spiritual beings, but even more than that, they are created spiritual beings. They are not eternal. Therefore, that excludes them from being gods. What's more, the context itself eliminates the idea that angels are the spirit of those men and women who are dead. For verses 13 and 14 of this chapter says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The Bible teaches it is faithful men and women who will inherit salvation. So angels are created beings that are different from men and women. So with that knowledge, what more can we know about angels? Turn if you would, uh, sorry, first of all, can we know what they look like? Turn if you would to Matthew 28, verses 2 and 3. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. If you want to know, this is the passage where we get the idea that angels are dressed in white. It is not a misunderstanding of this passage, for that's what it says. 
But you could also come away with the picture that an angel in spiritual form will be brilliant and glorious to look at, but not as glorious as God, for man could look at him, but could not look at the glory of God and live according to Scripture. What about wings? Do angels have wings? Well, in Exodus 25:20, when giving the instructions for making the mercy seat, creatures known as cherubim are mentioned, and they do possess wings. Like angels, cherubim are spiritual beings. However, from other scriptures, they appear to at least be in a distinct class of their own from what we might call regular angels. Since descriptions of what are definitely called angels aren't depicted with wings, it is doubtful then that they possess such. Angels are thus created beings with brilliant white clothing. The next question is, can we know when they were created and how many there are? The answer to both of those questions is we don't know. I'm afraid, I'm afraid to look at whether or not, I'm afraid to look at whether or not I have, uh, have this set up properly, but we'll see. So can we know when they were created and how many there are? And again, we can't know that answer. In our study of Job last week, it appears that angels were created before the creation week. For Job 38, 4 to 7 says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the stars shouted for joy. From Genesis 1, we know that the foundations of the earth were laid on day one. Mankind was not laid, or was not made until day six. So who are the sons of God here who shouted for joy? It is fairly safe to infer that we're talking about angels and not talking about men. But as to when they were created, we just don't know. The same goes with how many there are. In Matthew 26, 53, Jesus said that he could call for more than 12 legions of angels to come and save him if he wished. At that time, a Roman legion totaled around 6,000 men. So Jesus is talking about more than 72,000 angels. How many more than 12 legions are there? We just don't know. So it is useless to speculate. So angels are a large number of created spiritual beings with brilliant white clothing. Can we know what their job is? And that's why it seems like I missed a, a thing because I did. That is the proper slide. Can we know what the job of an angel is? Well, in the book of Revelation, they're depicted as worshiping God in heaven, much like we will be when we were there. But they had other duties as well. In Acts 12, verses 20 to 23, when Herod was smote with worms, it is said that the angel of God did this at his direction. So one of the duties is that they executed God's wrath against sin. Another duty is that angels fought for God's people in places like Daniel 10. Angels announced Christ's birth in Luke 2, verses 7 to 11. They proclaimed Jesus' return to heaven in Acts 1, verses 10 and 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 says that they will accompany Jesus at his second coming. While Luke 16, 19 to 22, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it reveals that they receive the dead and return them to the care of God. All of these questions, scriptures, can confirm. The natural question that follows is, can I know if angels work today? And if they do, have I seen one? We have to be careful how we answer this question. Do angels still worship God today? Yes, for Luke 15, 8 to 10 says, Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, 
sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls for her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So the angels are still worshiping God in heaven today. But do they bring more revelation from God? No, for Galatians 1, 8 and 9 says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so say I now again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. There is no new revelation today. The Holy Spirit isn't sending such, and neither are angels. What we have in our Bibles is all that we need as it pertains to life and godliness. We don't need anything more. Do angels still execute God's wrath for sin? Perhaps, but we can identify such because as we talked about a few weeks ago, God hasn't revealed any of his punishment for sin that this world currently faces. Do angels still care for Christians today? Yes, for we've already read Hebrews 1, 13 and 14 that angels are ministering spirits to those who will inherit salvation. Since this is true, have I ever seen an angel? I don't know. But if I did, I would not know it. For Hebrews 13, 1 and 2 says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. I'm not going to speculate further on this passage, but we'll accept what it says. There is plenty about the working of angels that we do not know and cannot know. But angels do exist, and they are working. That much we can know. The rest we'll leave up to God. So that's angels. What about demons? What about demons? What can we know about them? Well, for starters, the scriptures use demons, evil spirits, and unclean spirits interchangeably. This tells us that demons are spiritual beings and not physical beings. If you would turn to Mark chapter 5, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine were feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. What was wrong with the man in the story? He had an unclean spirit. We find out that this unclean spirit had a name, Legion, for it wasn't a, one unclean spirit, but many. Later on in this passage, however, Mark tells us that the demons were begging Jesus to allow them to possess the swine, showing us that when we read of demons, unclean spirits, or even evil spirits, like we read of in Acts 19, verses 13 to 16, we're not talking about three different types of beings, but one type of being. Demons, though, are described by one other name in Scripture, and that is angels. In Matthew 25, verse 41, we read, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, angel means messenger. So if angels of the Lord are messengers from the Lord, 
then angels of the devil are messengers from the devil. Now, unlike angels, where we get uh, a, lot, a lot of pictures about them, with demons we don't get as much detail. What can we know about what demons look like? While they are often depicted as red, I believe this has more to do with being associated with sin and sin being associated with red in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, we read, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I can find nowhere in the Bible where the devil or demons are said to be literally red. Yes, the devil is described as the red dragon in Revelation 12, 3, but that is symbolic imagery again, used in association with sin. Demons are spiritual beings. But apart from that, we do not know what they look like. Are they eternal? Well, the answer to that is no. God is the only one described in the Bible as eternal. Everything else is created. Satan is not the evil God, with Jehovah being the righteous God. Satan is not God, and neither are his demons. So if demons were created, can we know if they were created evil? Yes, we can know that. 1 John 1 verse 5 says that God is light and in him is no darkness. When referring to the creation of this universe, Genesis 1.31 says, Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. God did not create sin, and he does not create anything sinful. His creation is very good. So if God didn't create demons sinful, can we know when they became sinful? And the answer to that is, no, we cannot. All we know is what Jude verse 6 says, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Angels, like men, must have had free will. And at some point, some of them used that free will to rebel along with the devil, Satan, who is their leader. But when, we don't know. It's interesting to note, however, that unlike man who has the opportunity to repent and return to God through faith and obedience to Christ, God didn't give the opportunity to those angels who rebelled. How much then should we value the grace that God has extended to us, the ones he created in his own image, that he was Ill, even willing to save us in the first place? Moving on, can we know what the work of demons is? Well, in times past, they could possess people and get them to do things against their will. We don't know how or why this occurred, but scriptures do give us a terrible depiction of what it was like to be possessed by a demon. In Luke 9, verses 38 to 42, we read, Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, Look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. This is something that would be terrible to behold and terrible to experience. This child did not have some mental disease that caused this behavior. It was a demon who possessed him. But proving that this demon was not God himself, notice that Jesus cast him out and the demon obeyed. God does not obey us. We are to obey him. If this demon, if this demon obeyed Jesus, who is God, then this demon is not God. 
Can we know if demons still are able to do this today? Yes. Turn now to Zechariah chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. It is here that the, that the end of demon possession was prophesied. Zechariah 13, verse 1. In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Now, admittedly, this passage doesn't say when Jesus comes again, it will happen. That's true. But a fountain being opened to the house of David is messianic language that points to Jesus. Moreover, Jesus points to the fact that one of his missions while here on earth is to bind the power that Satan had. In Matthew 12, if you would go there, Matthew 12, let's read verses 22 to 29. Matthew 12, beginning at verse 22. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him. So that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. One of the powers that God allowed the devil to have was that his demons were able to possess man. I don't know any more on the subject other than that. However, when someone was possessed by a demon, they were completely controlled by that demon. They could not make their own choices. Salvation in Jesus Christ was going to be open to all, and everyone was going to have the choice of whether or not to obey. Therefore, Jesus had to bind the strong man. He had to take away Satan's power over man. In dying on the cross, Hebrews 2.14 said that Jesus took the power of death away from Satan. But casting out his demons, Jesus also took Satan's and the demons' power to possess mankind. Once the first century was over, demon possession was a thing of the past, for the time of miraculous gifts had passed away as well. The prophet and the unclean spirit had thus passed out of the land. So yes, demons at one time had the power to possess man, but they no longer have that power today. But was demon possession the only power the demons had? No. For scriptures also say that demons cause division and trouble. In James chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, we read, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. But where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. The wisdom that is from this earth that which causes strife and sin is not from above. It is sensual and demonic. It comes from demons. The question is, are they still at work today in this regard, even if they cannot possess us? From the passage here in James, it seems that they are. Recall from what we read earlier in Matthew 25, 41, Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This passage is a picture of final judgment. See here that hell is a place that at that time, at the time of final judgment, was prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, at final judgment, the devil and his angels are not in hell, though they soon will be. Before judgment, the devil was seen as roaming this earth. Peter would confirm this, for in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he said, be sober, be vigilant, be, because your adversary, the devil, 
walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If the devil is not in hell today, how can we say that his angels are? Sure, they do not have the power that they did before Jesus' death. But getting man to remain in sin is still the devil's goal. That he would use angels today to help accomplish this goal, like he did before, is supported from passages like James chapter 3. But regardless of everything, the devil nor his angels will win. Their final destination will be hell, away from the presence of God forever, no longer able to inflict those who are faithful any longer. And that's a day that Christians should thus be looking forward to. So that's what we can know about angels and demons. It's certainly not an exhaustive study, but I hope it has proved beneficial to you nonetheless. The scriptures, though, teach that angels rejoice when someone obeys the gospel. Salvation in Christ, then, is what we must be focusing most of our time on. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, have we in faith obeyed Jesus? Have we believed in him as the Son of God and our Savior? Have we repented of our sins? Have we confessed our faith before others? Have we been baptized for the remission of our sins? And if we have, have we been walking faithfully afterwards, seeking God's forgiveness when we fall? If we can't answer yes to all of those questions, then we're not on the road to heaven. If we haven't been baptized, or sorry, if we have been baptized, we are a Christian. And 1 John 1 verse 9 says that we can pray to God and ask him to forgive us of our sins if we repent. If we will do this, then we can return to the road that leads to heaven and obtain our inheritance if we continue on that road. If, however, we haven't obeyed Christ through belief, repentance, confession, and baptism, we cannot pray to God that he forgive us. We have to obey him in the first place. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor 